Next, we have oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Good morning, Speaker. This uh, question is for the Premier. After the previous Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing resigned in the midst of a scandal and, of course, this ongoing RCMP criminal investigation, there was a real opportunity for a new minister to actually take the housing crisis seriously. But last week's bill was weak, it was unambitious, and it lacked the vision that we need to actually get housing built. Among other shortcomings, the bill doesn't legalize fourplexes, uh, and as of right, which means they're going to remain illegal in many, many parts of this province. A single detached home is out of reach for about 80 per cent of Ontarians, but a fourplex apartment could be an affordable option. So why is the Premier ruling this out? And to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, uh, just the opposite. We're not ruling anything out. There is no law against that right now in the province uh, of Ontario, Speaker, so we encourage uh, municipalities to make the decisions that are in the best interests of, uh, of, uh, of their taxpayers, uh, Speaker. At the same time, uh, well over 7 million people in the province of Ontario already live in communities where, uh, uh, as of right for, is, uh, is the law. What we are running into, though, Mr. Speaker, is that this is not something that is uh, solving the crisis in any way, shape or form. My understanding is that although it's legal in the, in the City of Toronto, uh, less than 70 of these units have been built. I know in other communities like Vaughan, Richmond Hill, uh, uh, zero have been built. We also know that the as of right three has not uh, been as successful as we had hoped it to be. Less than 20,000 units have been built uh, on that program, Mr. Speaker. That is Response. why in this bill, we are removing the obstacles so that we can get the as of right three uh, uh, right across the province of Ontario, and we will allow our municipal partners to continue to make decisions on their behalf. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, that sounds like a lot of excuses. I should not have to remind this premier or this minister that legalizing fourplexes was a top recommendation of the government's own housing affordability task force. Uh, there are a lot of folks right now that are disappointed that this government has not implemented this recommendation, including the Ontario Real Estate Association. But it's just another example of how this government refuses to treat the housing crisis with the urgency that it deserves. What's the government's solution, Speaker? Well, according to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, it's telling people to go to a for-profit homeless encampment instead. Can the Premier explain why his government continues to fight the legalization of fourplexes? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Again, Speaker, I, I don't know how much more clear I can be to the Leader of the Opposition. There is no law that says you can't build a fourplex in the province of Ontario. So it is hard for me to legalize something that is currently not illegal in the province of Ontario. What we're focusing on, Mr. Speaker, is ensuring that there is infrastructure in the ground so that as opposed to building, let's say, 74 plexes in the city of Toronto, we can build 1.5 million homes across the province, Mr. Speaker. What the Leader of the Opposition fails to understand is that in order to build homes across the province of Ontario, our municipal partners need sewer and water capacity. And that is why the Minister of Infrastructure is bringing forward the largest infrastructure program for sewer and water and roads in the province's history. We're doing this in the absence of the federal government, Response. Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to do all that we can to put the infrastructure in the ground so that we can build not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of homes in every part of this province. Final supplementary. Speaker, $5 billion of federal money for housing is on the line because this Premier doesn't like a certain type of housing. That the government's new housing bill does nothing to get housing built. It spends as much time reversing this government's mistakes as it does putting forward any real solutions. And believe me, what it does put forward, forward is very piecemeal. In contrast, British Columbia's NDP government has moved swiftly, and they are seeing results, Speaker. While housing starts are down here in Ontario, they're up 11 per cent in British Columbia. There are new investments in non-market housing, new protections for tenants. So why won't this Premier implement the NDP solutions that have been proven to work in British Columbia? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
NDP solutions in the province of Ontario from 1990 to 1995. And if it wasn't for that premier sitting in the gallery today, we would still be suffering under the rules of the IT night. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The minister still has some time. Under the policies of this government, under the policies that were brought forward by the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, you know what we have? The highest starts in purpose-built rental housing, not over the last couple of years, but ever, Mr. Speaker. Under the policies of this government, we have the highest number of new home starts in decades under this government, Mr. Speaker. We're removing red tape so homes can get built faster, Mr. Speaker. We're building more university campuses by making it as of right so our students can have homes in the face of unilateral federal cuts. And, Mr. Speaker, we're listening to our municipal partners because the Minister of Infrastructure is bringing forward but. the largest unilateral infrastructure sewer and water program in history, and the Minister of Education is building school schools and all of these new communities, roads, everything, Mr. Speaker, we're getting it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question. Back to the Leader of the Opposition. I will remind the Minister that it was in 1995 that this province stopped building truly affordable housing in this province. And we are behind by 1.4 million units right now because of that decision. Uh, last week, the Premier doubled down on preventing new homes from having EV charging infrastructure. Now, the government knows the cost of installing an EV charger during construction is so much cheaper than putting one in later. Drivers say the lack of charging infrastructure is a huge barrier for those who would otherwise own an electric vehicle. So why has this Premier refused to make it easier for people to buy and charge an electric vehicle in their home? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. We've done no such thing. In fact, we're making massive investments so that people have jobs and can buy electric vehicles. See, what the opposition would rather do is they'd rather keep people unemployed and then subsidize them to buy vehicles. Mr. Speaker, what we'd want is to give people the ability to work in the province of Ontario. $28 billion worth of investments. But as I said last Thursday, Mr. Speaker, as I said last Thursday, it is not up to the government of Ontario to fund a decision that you make, Mr. Speaker. She talks about British Columbia, the highest price for gas in British Columbia, the highest expenses, the place that is most expensive to live in the country, British Columbia, Mr. Speaker. We are bringing jobs back, opportunity back. That is the record of this government, 700,000 jobs, cutting taxes, cutting red tape, bringing back employment Spons. to the province of Ontario in the same way that the 22nd Premier of the province of Ontario did, each and every day focused on the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, I'll go back to the Premier. I don't think the minister has been following what's happening in the sector, but EV sales are down here in the province of Ontario, and the Premier isn't doing anything about it. Not only is he jeopardizing the so-called province's Order. Made in Ontario electric vehicle Order. program, he's risking the tens of thousands of good jobs that go with it, like the workers in Oakville, the workers Order. in Oakville who feel let down by the Pro Premier's lack of action uh, or the delay of EV production by Ford Motor Company. So back to the Premier. Workers in Oakville are worried. Will you show some leadership, or will you leave them behind like you did with the GM workers in Oshawa? Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, chased 300,000 manufacturing jobs out of our province and brought our auto sector to the brink of collapse. Speaker. In 2019, Reuters reported that companies planned to spend $300 billion on EVs, and none of it was coming to Canada. Speaker. Since then, over the last three years, Ontario has attracted 28 billion dollars in new EV investments, creating thousands of good-paying jobs across the province. Unfortunately, the NDP and the Liberals voted against every single item that brought this unprecedented success 
to Ontario. By creating the conditions for businesses to succeed, our province is now a global auto manufacturing powerhouse. Speaker. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Brampton North will come to order. The Minister of Education will come to order. I heard you. <laughs> Start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, Ontario has the workers. We have the expertise, and we have the energy to power a strong EV sector here. It used to be a signature policy of this government, but now they're throwing it in reverse with a weak commitment to electrical vehicles and sustainable infrastructure. In the process, this Premier is jeopardizing sales and production by not making our new homes EV ready. It is so short-sighted. The people of Ontario want to know, and I'll go back to the Premier again, is the government backing away from plans for a sustainable auto sector in Ontario? Members of please take their seats. And to reply, the Minister of Energy. Speaker, it's quite clear that our plan is working. 300,000 manufacturing jobs left our province for other jurisdictions. At a time when those who were running the auto plants were saying that Ontario is the most uncompetitive jurisdiction in North America to build cars, to now six years later investing $28 billion into EV platforms, EV battery manufacturing facilities, and the world is moving to EVs in Ontario because we have the energy and we're committed to building the energy infrastructure to support the implementation of electric vehicles. Now, the NDP energy critic is against all of the investments that we're making in our nuclear sector, including building small modular reactors at Darlington, leading the world on that front, but. putting an extra 4.8 gigawatts at Bruce Power, refurbishing the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station, Mr. Speaker. That's how we're going to power Ontario well into the future. Order. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This government has boasted about their electric vehicle investment, but like so much they do, they aren't plugged into what is really needed. <laughs> Folks are excited about electric vehicles, but they won't buy them if they know they can't charge them. When this Premier was elected in 2018, one of his first moves was to rip out EV charging stations, cancel EV rebates, and end the building code requirement to make sure homes were wired and ready. Without the infrastructure, automakers are signaling a slowdown on EV production. This Premier is putting good auto jobs at risk. When will this Premier switch gears and support the future of electric vehicles by committing to the charging infrastructure that they will require? Uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, Speaker, let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Let's see what we've done. So, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade has encouraged $28 billion worth of EV manufacture to the province of Ontario. The Minister of Mines and Northern Development is unlocking, is unlocking the resources of the North so that we can power the investments in the South. The Minister of Energy is investing in small modular reactors, so the opposition knows these are the reactors that will power the EV revolution of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, while refurbishing our nuclear fleet. And later today, we will be voting on an NDP bill that will kill what the Minister of Energy is doing, put in jeopardy what the Minister of Natural Resources is doing, and put in jeopardy the $28 billion worth of investments. So this is what I tell you. We will vote against that, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue our Response. program of investing in the people of the province of Ontario so that they have the resources to invest in themselves, they have the resources to invest in their communities. It's about giving people the, the tools they need to succeed. And the supplementary question. Thank you. And again, my question is for the Premier. The future is electric, on the road, across communities, and at home. Building EV-ready homes is future-proof, but that's not what we're building today. Aftermarket charging infrastructure is expensive, and when compared to the minimal cost of wires and the rough-in in a new build, planning ahead is the way to go. EV-ready homes are more affordable for homeowners and drivers. This Premier has said he's picking the side of developers, but we hope he will switch to be on the side of auto manufacturers, auto workers, drivers and homeowners. 
Building houses already roughed in for charging is an easy and practical fix that we could do today to save people a lot of money. So my question is, will the Premier put charging rough-ins back in the building code so we can have EV-ready homes? Minister of School Affairs and Housing. No, Mr. Speaker. What we will do is we will allow homeowners to make those decisions on their own, Mr. Speaker, because that is what we do. Speaker, we allow homeowners to make that decision on their own. As I said on Thursday, I come from an Italian family. Many of my relatives, even ourselves, we had a stove in the garage. It was a 220-volt stove because a lot of us like to cook in the garage. I didn't ask the people of the province of Ontario to cover the cost of that stove in the garage. You know what my dad did? He called an electrician who put the stove plug in the garage and he paid for it, Mr. Speaker. So I think the people of the province of Ontario can make that decision on their own. They don't need big daddy government coming on their behalf. My goal is to keep the price of home building low so that more Ontarians can afford to build it, not higher. The member for Oshawa will come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. Order. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent, Leamington. Hey, good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. On April 1st, the federal Liberals, supported by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, increased the carbon tax by 23 per cent. This costly tax is raising the price of everything, from both energy costs to food prices. It's forcing Ontario drivers to pay over 17 cents per litre more at the gas pumps. Speaker, it's so disappointing to see the Liberal and NDP members of this legislature turning a blind eye to the hardships people everywhere are experiencing. They should be joining us and calling on the federal government to scrap the carbon tax now. Speaker, can the minister please explain why the carbon tax is causing damage to all, all aspects of life for the people of Ontario? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Energy. Thanks very much. Thanks to the great member from uh, southwestern Ontario who's always standing up for residents in his part of Ontario and ensuring that they can afford to live in our province as we continue to reduce taxes and reduce fees and reduce the cost of living. The federal government continues to jack it up. And on April 1st, just a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, uh, the federal government did it again, a whopping increase of 23 percent to the federal carbon tax, which is impacting the price at the pumps. It's impacting the price of home heating for natural gas uh, furnaces. It's introducing uh, the price of the grocery store, Mr. Speaker. It's impacting the cost of living in Ontario. And last week we saw something interesting at the federal parliament. We actually saw the federal NDP with Jagmeet, and we saw uh, the Parti Québécois, or actually the separatist party, uh, supporting a conservative motion to encourage uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, who increased the carbon tax, to meet with premiers right across the country. All of them are opposed to the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. It's time to sit down, have that discussion, and also scrap the tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the minister for that response. It's reassuring to hear that our government continues to stand up to the federal government and fight for the people of this province. Speaker, people in my riding of Chatham, Kent, Leamington are concerned about the impact of a whopping 23% carbon, ta carbon tax hike will have on their home energy bills. They feel it's unfair to them and communities across Ontario that the federal Liberals have burdened us with this unnecessary cost. Our government will not give up, Speaker. We'll continue to fight this tax, deliver affordability for Ontario, and put more money back in people's pockets. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax is punishing people in Chatham, Kent, Leamington, and throughout Ontario who rely on natural gas and propane to heat their homes? Minister of Energy. Uh, speaker, it's pretty simple. The federal carbon tax is right there on the bill, clearly marked for anybody who's an Enbridge customer or has uh, natural gas coming into their home, Mr. Speaker. It's the federal carbon tax right there on the bill that sometimes actually is more expensive than delivery costs. And, you know, 
the people of Ontario are feeling the pinch, but it's not just the people of Ontario. It's people right across the country that are getting hammered uh, by this federal carbon tax. Uh, just look at Newfoundland, where the Liberal Premier Andrew Freire has uh, actually pleaded with Prime Minister Trudeau to put the pause on back on April 1st, but since he hasn't done that, he's now joined the chorus of premiers of all stripes uh, from right across the country to sit down and have an adult discussion, something the Prime Minister hasn't done since 2016 with the Premier's Speaker. And so we believe that uh, the Prime Minister should be sitting down with those premiers. And I just wish that the Queen of the Carbon Tax here in Ontario, the Liberal leader, would support us in sitting down and having that mature discussion about axing the tax in Ontario. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing. A new report shows Ontario rents have risen three times higher than guidelines due to rent control loopholes, with an average increase of 54.5 per cent over the last decade. Thousands of tenants in Parkdale High Park and across Ontario are experiencing massive increase to cost of housing, and there is no end in sight. My question is, will you close rent control loopholes so Ontarians can find and maintain housing? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I'm very proud of the number of purpose-built rentals, Mr. Speaker, that we have, we have increased. As the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing mentioned not too long ago, just moments ago, Mr. Speaker, we have historic records of rental of, of purpose-built uh, buildings, Mr. Speaker, and that is something that is important to the people of the province of Ontario who need a place to live. We are working non-stop at achieving our goal of 1.5 million housing units, Mr. Speaker, and we will get there. We'll get there with or without the help of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, who would vote against every single initiative that we do when we achieve these records. Mr. Speaker, I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Supplementary, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Premier. Today, my constituent Lindsay is receiving an N13. This is a demeviction notice. She tells me, and I quote, as a tenant who is now dealing with finding a home on top of dealing with the immediate aftermath of experiencing domestic violence, I'm at a complete loss. All of the homes being built are not made for people like me and my two young children. I started looking for housing options so that I can continue to live and work in Toronto once them evicted, but there is nowhere safe that I can afford to raise my family. Speaker, there is no affordable rental housing in Ontario because of the rent control loopholes that have been introduced by the Conservative government. Will this government admit that they have the power to help Lindsay and her two young children and by introducing real rent control today? Members will take their seats. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and the reason that we have a housing challenge isn't because of a particular policy that we put in place, Mr. Speaker. It's because the Liberals, during their entire mandate, supported by the NDP at every turn, did absolutely nothing except create red tape, create barriers, get nothing built, Order. Mr. Speaker, absolutely nothing. Now, when this government came to power, Mr. Speaker, we recognized the crisis for what it is, and we made a public commitment. The Premier made a commitment. The Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister made a commitment. We will build 1.5 million spaces, Mr. Speaker, and we'll do it notwithstanding that we're starting from behind. We're starting from behind because no investments were made, no money was put forward, the red Order. tape was building up, Mr. Speaker, Response. but we will persevere. We will get the job done. We are getting the job done, Mr. Speaker, and we will not apologize for that. Next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Great, Minister. Speaker, the federal Liberals think that they know better than the hard-working people of this province. When people are hurting because of the rising cost of living, it seems logical that governments of all political stripes would do their part to reduce costs. But instead, the Liberals are doing the opposite. They are hiking taxes at a time when families are already struggling to get by. Families are having, a hard, having trouble heating their homes, filling their gas tanks, and putting food on the table. And the Liberal solution is to make things more expensive? 
The worst part is Bonnie Crombie and her Liberal colleagues don't even have the guts to stand up and tell the Prime Minister to get rid of this <coughs> terrible tax. Speaker, can the Minister please explain Question. what risks the federal carbon tax pose to our economy? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. The federal Liberals are doing to our country what the previous provincial Liberals did to the province of Ontario. They're raising taxes at every opportunity. They chased businesses and jobs out of the province. Our manufacturing sector was on the brink of collapse with 300,000 manufacturing jobs lost. Now, we came in and lowered costs right across the board. We restored Ontario's ability to compete on the global stage. 700,000 more men and women are working today than before we took office. Speaker, our message to the federal government is clear. Do not jeopardize the progress that we have made. Scrap Response. the tax today. Supplementary, back to the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Speaker, we've heard loud and clear from the people of Ontario. The last thing they want is a carbon tax. But the federal Liberals are act actively ignoring the concerns of hardworking Ontario families, just as the previous Liberal provincial government did. Oh, we don't believe the way to fight climate change is by crushing businesses and workers with tax hikes, and neither do the people of Ontario. We have an abundance of clean energy right here in our province, and we're making sure Ontario is a leader in building clean tech for the future, like electric vehicles. That's how to help lower emissions, not by implementing a carbon tax that drives the cost of everything up and up and up. Speaker, can the minister explain how the carbon tax will hurt the progress that we've made in reducing costs so that businesses and workers can succeed? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the previous Liberal government's high taxes chased businesses and workers out of the province. But when we took office, we reversed course. We cut 500 pieces of red tape, saving businesses $1 billion annually. We put an immediate equipment write-off in, saving businesses nearly a $1 billion every single year. We lowered WSIB premiums by 50 per cent, saving businesses $2.5 billion annually. And as a result, Speaker, those businesses who fled the province under the Liberals, they're coming back. Speaker, we have reshored companies who left for cheaper, more competing jurisdictions. And we've rebuilt our province's manufacturing might with 700,000 new people working Response. again. Speaker, we can't allow the Liberals to crush our momentum. Scrap the tax today. Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The owner of property in Innisfil has been charging people facing housing insecurity $500 to set up a tent on their property. The ad for the property notes that they will have access to a communal washroom and kitchen. Shockingly, instead of working to resolve this province's homelessness crisis, the member for Innisfil has started referring people to this for-profit encampment. My question to the Premier is this. Is he going to start counting tents as part of their affordable housing numbers? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, uh, it, really, it really highlights just how irrelevant the NDP have come on pretty much every single policy issue facing the province of Ontario, right? Uh, the reality is this, Mr. Speaker. We have increased uh, funding to the uh, Homeless Prevention Program to record levels. The member will know this because she voted against that, as did the entire NDP caucus, uh, uh, Speaker. We've actually increased homeless prevention funding in every part of the province, including in the member's own riding, by 34%. She will recall that she voted against that, uh, that as well, Mr. Speaker. What we are doing across the province of Ontario is restoring, rehabilitating and renovating our affordable housing stock. You know why? Because we were left with an infrastructure deficit by the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP. What have we done? We are renovating, rehabilitating, restoring 123 
1,000 affordable housing units in the province of Ontario. That is an unmatched Spots. record in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to support those who want help, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister of Children and Community Services said, we will leave no one behind. That is our goal each and every day. Supplementary, back to the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. It's, it's clear uh, to the minister that you're going to help people that are in need of help, that want help, by referring them to for-profit uh, encampments. That's what your government is doing. Unfortunately, this is shocking, but not surprising. This for-profit encampment is targeted toward people who are on OW or ODSP because the programs don't even cover the cost of rent. Yeah. This Conservative government has fueled a housing and affordability crisis, and now they seem to be endorsing its exploitation. Speaker, will the Premier tell Ontarians whether for-profit encampments are part of his affordable housing strategy? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And uh, again, Speaker, a, uh, uh, a truly uh, 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 a question from the NDP that really just highlights how just irrelevant they are in the discourse in the province of Ontario. Uh, speaker, it is no wonder nobody pays attention to them. It is no wonder that members leave their caucus in droves, Mr. Speaker. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. We're putting infrastructure in the ground. You know why we're putting infrastructure in the ground, colleagues? So that we can build millions of homes across the province of Ontario. You know why we have to do this work, Speaker? Because for 15 long, long, arduous years, the former Liberal government did absolutely nothing. And you know who supported them in that? The NDP, the most irrelevant party that this province has ever seen. Now, to go a step further, there is they're as irrelevant in Ottawa as they are in Queen's Park, Mr. Speaker. Ignoring what the people of the province need, ignoring what the people of Canada need, you have an opportunity later today. Vote for our budget because it has historic levels of The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. I never thought I'd see the day when having a family doctor in Ontario made you lucky. When people paid hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, just to access primary care. When riding the subway meant being bombarded with advertisements for health care services that should be insured but aren't. Looking back at the last six years, a lot has changed. Now we have nurse practitioner-led clinics charging subscri subscription fees to desperate patients, while executive health clinics make a fortune in a primary care marketplace of this government's making. By 2026, 4.4 million people won't have access to a family doctor, and we can't even say that our emergency departments are always open anymore. Mr. Speaker, with so little to show under his watch, why is it that the Premier only increased health care sector set of funding by 0.59%, but has more than doubled the amount that he pays the staff in his own office. The Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Oh, Speaker, it continues to amaze me that members of the Liberal Party who actually cut the number of residency spots available for Ontario students wishing to practice and learn medicine in the province of Ontario can stand up and talk about our record. Our record clearly shows that we are investing in a health care system, whether that is including a base, increasing new medical schools in York Region, in Brampton, in Scarborough, ensuring that we have new clinicians able to train, practice, learn, and ultimately be licensed in the province of Ontario. We are making those investments because we know that people need to have access to primary care pr practitioners. You know, I look at the announcement that we made in February, the expansion of primary care, including nurse practitioner-led clinics in his Response. own community across, and across Ontario, and I see those investments already bearing fruit because we already have additional clinicians hired taking on new patients. Thank you. The supplementary question, number for Don Valley East. Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate to hear the Minister of Health talk about her record because she admits, omits the fact that her record is of the worst health care system performance in our province's history. This government is so busy rewarding its friends and enriching insiders that they have forgotten their duty to uphold the Canada Health Act. 
but perhaps forgetting is too generous because every time the government neglects another feature of public health brings another feature of public health care to its knees there's always a private for-profit model there to save the day whether it is exorbitant subscription fees to nurse practitioners or executive health clinics, whether it's pricey pap smears or costly cataract lenses, whether it's staffing agencies gouging our hospitals and long-term care homes, this government rolls out the red carpet for anyone praying to the almighty dollar. Question. Mr. Speaker, what should patients who can't afford this Premier's private health care agenda do once his gravy train has left our public health care system behind in the dust? And the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The Liberal member opposite can throw around all the quips he wants. The truth is that we are making investments in our publicly funded health care system in Ontario. Here, here, here. Ontario leads Canada in the lowest wait times for surgeries across Canada. Here, here. Ontario leads Canada in the number of individuals who are matched with a primary care practitioner. We will continue to make those investments because we see how they are changing lives in the province of Ontario. In Minto, Ontario, a February announcement led to a nurse practitioner being hired and already taking on new practitioners, That's new patients. In Kingston, Ontario, we have clinicians who are bringing on new patients, rostering new patients in their communities. That Response. work will continue across 78 new facilities and expanded uh, practitioner-led clinics because we know it's making an impact and we know we are changing lives. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. The Liberal carbon tax is punishing Ontario families. Last year, the federal government decided to exempt one form of home heating fuel, mainly used in Atlantic Canada, from the carbon tax. But they're hiking the carbon tax on lower emission natural gas here in Ontario, where the majority of residents now have to pay more to heat their homes. That's just not right. Residents in my riding of Thornhill tell me they already feel the impact of the carbon tax on their energy bills. Speaker, can the people of Ontario, they deserve to be treated fairly. The federal Liberals need to get rid of this carbon tax right now. Speaker, can the minister please explain how uh, he's making uh, home heating and everything else more, or sorry, how they're making uh, home heating and more uh, uh, things expensive for the, and impacting Ontarians? To reply, the Minister of Energy. We're doing everything we can to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario here under the leadership of Premier Ford, while Prime Minister Trudeau and the federal Liberals seem content uh, to make life more expensive for the people of Ontario and the people of Canada. And that goes for the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, as well, who seems happy to have the federal carbon tax in place so that she doesn't have to take a position on it, Mr. Speaker. Now, we have taken a position on it. We're making life more affordable, and that's why we're seeing uh, new investments in our province, particularly in the EV and EV auto space, uh, where companies are flocking back to Ontario and creating hundreds of thousands of jobs in our province again, where under the leadership of the previous Liberal government for 15 years, we saw 300,000 jobs leaving for other jurisdictions. Over 700,000 jobs are coming back, Mr. Speaker, and that's all because of our sound energy policy that ensures we're competitive with other jurisdictions. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his solid work uh, within his portfolio. This is exactly what our government spoke up about, the carbon tax, what we fought tooth and nail. It's ludicrous that the Liberals think it's a good idea to raise the carbon tax by a staggering 23 per cent when Ontario families are already struggling with the increased cost of living. But, Speaker, this is most concerning. Uh, to, this, is, this gets so much worse. The federal government and opposition parties want to nearly triple the tax by 2030. That's simply not acceptable. Speaker, can the uh, minister please explain why Ontarians cannot afford the continued tax increase on groceries, transportation, and everything else in between? Minister of Energy. Speaker, thanks again to the member from Thornhill for the question. It's pretty obvious when you drive by 
a gasoline station now, and you see the price of the pumps is over a buck sixty, and in some parts of northern Ontario, more than that. The carbon tax has gone up a staggering 23 per cent two weeks ago on April the 1st under the leadership of Prime Minister Trudeau and the federal Liberal government, supported by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, and her Ontario Liberals, who still continue to say that the people of Ontario and the people of Canada are better off with this horrible carbon tax than they would be without it, Mr. Speaker. And the NDP, while some of them have supported us in the House, Jagmeet on the weekend was trying to walk back his demands uh, to, uh, to have a carbon tax or, or not. He's supportive of the carbon tax Lots. again, but that's typical of NDP policy, Mr. Speaker. They don't know which way to go. We're with the people of Ontario. The opposition parties are against them, particularly on energy. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. We've learned a lot about the impact of Bill 7. Hundreds of families forced from their communities. Cancer survivors find $400 a day unless they follow the Premier's orders to leave their families. We didn't learn of Bill 7 impacts because of the transparency of this government. We learned it from the hard work of the reporters. Now the government is refusing to tell the public how much they're fining seniors. Will the minister stand up today and tell the public how much money they have fined seniors for the crime of wanting to stay close to their families? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, what Bill 7 has allowed hospitals to do is to actually ensure that they have beds available for people who need them in an acute way. You know, the treatments, the ongoing rehabilitation that happens outside of a hospital setting is made available because of the ability for hospitals to ensure that alternative level of care patients are being looked after in different places, whether it is in community, whether it is in our long-term care homes. And I'm proud of the fact that we've had over 2,000 individuals have a home in their community because we've taken the time working with our long-term care partners, with our hospital partners, to make sure that they have the appropriate care in the appropriate place. A home, Speaker. Please supplement your question. Back to the Premier. As expected, there's no transparency answer from the minister, whatever one decides to answer. Look at the action of this government. First, they say they're not aware of anyone being fined under Bill 7. Then, when shown the actual bills sent to the patients, they come clean and tell us seven patients have been charged. Now, after daily requests, the government refuses to tell the media how much they fine seniors Sounds like the Conservatives are really proud of their legislation. If the Premier thinks Bill 7 is such great legislation, helping seniors get into long-term care, why won't you tell the public how much you're finding seniors? And again, the Minister of Health. As the member opposite just clearly showed, it is such a small number of individuals who've been billed by the hospitals that we've actually been told. We have a legal opinion Order. that says Order. putting out those numbers would make would put at risk individuals individual uh, identity to be identified. We're protecting patients to ensure that that doesn't happen. And we, have, we have ensured that such a small number have been had to be billed by their local hospitals that we want to make Order. sure that the work is at the hospital and the community working with the most appropriate placement, and we will continue to do that. Stop the clock. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. The member for Niagara Falls will come to order. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The housing crisis is getting worse. It's like a forest fire raging out of control. But the government's new housing bill is like bringing a garden hose to put out the fire. After wasting six years 
putting wealthy, well-connected insiders ahead of building homes that people can actually afford. It feels like the government is admitting defeat, begging municipalities to bail them out when the Premier says no to building homes that people can afford in the communities they know and love. So, Speaker, will the Premier stop saying no to an entire generation of young people who just want a home they can afford and say yes to legalizing gentle density and mid-rise housing across the province as of right so we can start building homes people can afford now? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I love the passion from the member, but when it comes to building in his own community, uh, an as of right for community, a sum total of zero have been built, Mr. Speaker. You know why that is? Because the city of Guelph needs infrastructure. They need sewer and water capacity. I hear it from the mayor constantly. I had a wonderful conversation with the mayor when we were providing a Building Faster Fund check, who identified the fact that his additional assistance through the Building Faster Fund would go to building more sewer and water capacity so that he could build even more homes, Mr. Speaker. So the opposition can focus on policies that do nothing because it makes them feel better. We saw that from the Liberals for 15 years, right? Announce all kinds of things, but don't accomplish anything. That's all that they care about. We'll build the sewer and water capacity so that we could build not hundreds, not tens, not 74 plexes in Toronto, zero in Guelph, but millions of homes in every Spons. part of this province, Mr. Speaker, because that's how we will tackle the affordability crisis. The uh, supplementary question. Speaker, this government has been in power for six years, and the housing crisis gets worse. They've spent more time in the last year reversing their housing policies than actually putting forward bold solutions to the housing crisis. As a matter of fact, it was this government that took infrastructure money away from municipalities in the first place. The government's failure to fix the housing crisis is making life in Ontario unaffordable. And the Premier says no to general density, no to mid-rises, no to missing middle, no to rent protection, no to federal funding for homes. It's time to say yes to housing in this province. The government has the power to say yes to 6 to 11-story buildings along major transit corridors, to say yes to multiplexes. Respond. Will we do rather. it now question. so we can get building homes in this province? And response. In fact, in the provincial policy statement and the provincial planning statement, which was released at the same time, it does just that. But you can't do any of that unless you have infrastructure that allows that to happen. It allows it to happen, right? This is the fallacy of what you hear from the Greens, the Liberals, and the NDP. They get up in their place and they, they fight for policies that they know won't build homes, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing is putting in the infrastructure that is needed to build a home. But you know what else we're hearing, Mr. Speaker? We're hearing that the high inflation policies of the federal government, the federal Liberal government, a carbon tax, which has led to high interest rates, are stopping people from getting shovels in the ground. And more importantly, Speaker, it is stopping from people from being able to afford those homes. So why don't the members opposite work with us Response. to get the federal government to eliminate the carbon tax, reduce to cost, Mr. Speaker, bring down red tape, bring down all costs, bring down interest rates, and we will meet our challenge at this year. Next question. Order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Next question. The member for Essex. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the small business uh, service delivery ministry. Since, for a few years rather, this sector has been able to secure funds, but this promise was made five years ago. We have a federal liberal government that admitted that they owe $1.3 billion back to small businesses, but no plan has been made. 
The Liberal federal government has $1.3 billion that they should give back to small businesses. Does the associate minister can explain what are the impacts of this situation on small businesses? Mary Prescott Russell. Merci, uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague, the member for Essex, for mentioning this problem that so many small businesses in Ontario are facing. Since the beginning, our, bis our government rather stated how much we support our small businesses by scrapping the tax, the carbon tax. After five years, the Liberal government hasn't filed filled its promise to reimburse $1.3 billion that were promised to small businesses in our province. This is a money, a sum of money that could have been reinvested in their businesses. We have staff and communities that could benefit from these funds. People were burdened by financial measures, and we can see that everything is affected, the cost of life is affected. We are listening, small businesses in Ontario, and we will continue to ask the federal government to scrap this tax. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Parliamentary Associate for that answer. The federal government has just abandoned Ontario's small businesses when it comes to refunding the carbon tax. Speaker, this is an issue that goes well beyond the simple question of, ref of refunds. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business has told us that more than half of businesses will be forced to increase their prices. And that's the last thing, and the last thing they need is another increase in this Liberal tax. Speaker, can the Parliamentary Associate tell us how our provincial government is supporting small businesses at a time when the federal liberal tax is threatening their very survival. Thank you to the wonderful member from Essex. My colleague is quite right to talk about the devastating effects that the carbon tax has on Ontario small businesses and families. The cost can, will, can, the cost is making Budget, balancing the budget for business is almost impossible. Whether it's a matter of the increased cost for producers, for farmers, or for more expensive transportation of goods across the, the province and country, the consequences are undeniable, except for the federal liberal government and the provincial liberals who are just obsessed with wanting to increase taxes. Our government is on the side of businesses and is working hard to reduce their costs, contrary to the head of the provincial liberals, Bonnie Crombie, who, is, who wants an even higher carbon tax. We will continue to struggle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Almost 500 uh, letters for uh, temporary permission to teach in French were issued last year. The right to have to have an equivalent level of education has been violated for francophone students. What are you planning to do to s correct the state of affairs for French language students? Madam Minister, thank you to the member for the question. He knows full well, Speaker, that our government has been working hard on a strategy to hire and retrain French language teachers. For example, we've doubled the number of spaces for teachers at the University of the University of, of Ontario Français last year. 
since that time, given the growing interest of parents in French language education for their children and for francophones who have a constitutional right to this education, we since 2018, we've invested more than $240 million speakers in French language school boards to build 18 new schools and to make institution in, 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 in enlarging and in expanding six of these calls. We have a lot more to do, and that's why I'm working closely with the Minister of Education to ensure that Ontario's francophones have access to teachers and schools in the French language. Well, it's not working out very well for many uh, French language school, school boards. To the same minister, almost half of French language uh, citizens seek, uh, ask for services in English when they are looking for a family doctor, hoping to speed up the process. Madam Minister, why is there nothing in the budget to settle the problem of doctors offering their services in the French language in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. Our government was the first government in three decades to modernize the law on French services in Ontario. That's how much we realize it's imp how important it is to expand service to French language services. We've provided an all-round strategy to hire and train French language skilled workers to provide French language services to francophones across Ontario, including in the healthcare sector, doctors, nurses. We work with, we're working with the Montfort Hospital and the University of Ottawa and colleges and universities across the province to ensure that we have enough health care workers in the French language. We've also been working with the federal government to demand that they have a special category of French language immigrants for the health care sector. I, we don't have any announcements to make right now, but we've been working on this problem for many years. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Scarborough Aging Court. Thank you. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The federal Liberal government raised the carbon tax by 23% on April the 1st. As Premier Ford has warned since day one, this tax is raising the cost of everything. It increases building costs and makes it more expensive to construct long-term care homes. That's not fair. Speaker, the Liberals, led by Bonnie Crombie, queen of the carbon tax, continue to remain silent on this topic. Unlike the Liberals, our government will continue to speak up continue to fight for our seniors, and continue to deliver real affordability. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what our government is doing to build more homes and support seniors in our province? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, Speaker, this government has a plan, and let's contrast that plan with the plan that the Liberals, or lack thereof, had since 2003, 21 years ago, right? Uh, and they held that power until 2018, and in that time, Speaker, when they exited government, 611 net new beds to show for their efforts. Now, Speaker, that's not enough for an aging population. This government knows that. That's why, since assuming office, we introduced the largest capital expansion plan in this country's history to build and redevelop 58,000 spaces for our great seniors in this province of ours. And speaker, up to date, 18,000 spaces have been built or are under construction. However, we are facing challenges indeed, Speaker, thanks to this carbon tax and the 23% increase on April 1st. In fact, Speaker, that's why this budget introduces over $155 million to help our government continue to build Ontario's long-term care sector, an additional $200 million that homes Response. can use towards capital development. Now, Speaker, we have two minutes and 25 seconds until we vote on that budget. It's never late, too late to do the right thing. I hope the Liberals vote in favour. And the supplementary question. Thank you to the Minister. Speaker, my constituents will be pleased to hear 
how our government is building new long-term care homes and the standing up for Ontario citizens. Speaker, our seniors deserve to receive the care that they need and enjoy the high quality of life that they deserve in a long-term care home. But the carbon tax is increasing the price of everything, from the cost of building material and transport to the day-to-day -day operations of the long-term care homes. Our government will always support Ontario families and ensure seniors they can stay in the communities they help build close to their loved ones. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what our government Question. is doing to protect Ontario's families, especially our seniors, from the negative impact of the carbon tax? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, this government is doing a lot, but you know what would help our efforts is if the Liberals standing just uh, sitting to the left of that fine member would call their buddies in, in Ottawa and tell them, get rid of this tax. I mean, there's federal MPs doing the same for the Liberal Party. Why can't the MPPs in this legislature do the same? To the member's point, 40.5 percent increase in construction costs in that member's riding. That is a severe challenge to getting these spaces online. And Speaker, we know that we need it. I know that member's riding. I have visited that member's riding. It is a diverse riding. People come here from all over the world. And what we all have in common is that somewhere in our lives, we have a senior who built our lives as we know it, who gave us the opportunities that we have in this great country of ours. Stand with us to the Liberal Party over there. Stand against the queen of the carbon tax and Response. say to ask this tax, let's get shovels in the ground. Let's take care of our seniors in this great country. Next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, the Ministry of Transportation operates uh, 27 airports in the Shinawaski Nation territory. The First Nations rely on these airports for critical goods and services. Speaker, um, the waiting areas are substandard. Unsafe facilities for passengers and uh, pilots alike. The airports in Kiwetanung still need runway extensions and modern navigational aids to improve the flight access. Speaker, uh, when will the waiting areas in these airports be held up to standard and make sure that these runways are extended? And uh, when, when will these standards uh, be expected to like, uh, be brought up to standard just like any other airport in Ontario? Reply, the Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, our teams have been working with uh, many of the airports uh, in those uh, northern uh, communities. Um, and I can assure the member that we'll continue to work uh, uh, with them as the uh, province has provided um, a commitment to 100% of the remote uh, funding on an operational side, $14.5 million every single year. But we'll continue uh, and share those uh, issues that have been raised by that member um, with respect to some of the flooding uh, are taken uh, care of and that we work together to ensure that those are, are fixed so we can continue to support that vital um, that piece of infrastructure in our north. So I look forward to working with the member on that uh, specifically. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.